Today on Applied Science, I'd like to talk about these anti-theft tags. You've probably seen these little rectangular tags that set the alarm off if you try to exit the store before this is deactivated. And they actually work by uh, having a little tuning fork inside here that's controlled by a magnet. And so I'll show with the scope uh, what the signals look like, and I'll also show under the microscope the tuning fork moving. Uh, but first, I'd like to give a big thanks to my Patreon subscribers. You've probably noticed the upgrades. I have better lighting, much better sound, and this is all thanks to the uh, donations made through Patreon. Uh, behind me, I have a blackboard that I'm going to dress up with stuff that viewers have sent in. And so uh, check out the new uh, donation levels to see uh, how you can support the channel. Thanks very much. There are a few different techniques to make these anti-theft tags, but today I'm going to talk about these hard plastic rectangular ones that use magnetoacoustic technology to work. So there's uh, quite a bit of misinformation on the internet about these. And uh, for a while, I believed that the way these worked is they responded to a magnetic field and then emitted sound, you know, hence the name magnetoacoustic. But that's actually not quite right. So let's cut one of these open and see what the deal is here. There's two really shiny thin metal ribbons that are free floating inside here. You saw I just cut the end off and just dumped them out. And so we'll put these here. And then the uh, tag itself has another metal strip that's actually part of the um, adhesive that holds the tag together. In this particular tag, the metal is actually uh, laminated inside the plastic. So there's, the tag has sort of a hard plastic um, top piece. And then this bottom part, the actual adhesive part, has the metal strip laminated in there. So the thing that makes these work is the principle of magnetostriction, which is pretty cool. So if you take a piece of metal, uh, ferrous metal, and put it into a magnetic field, it will actually change shape slightly, very slightly. Uh, but the point is that you can actually um, make this thing oscillate, make it vibrate back and forth by just putting it into an oscillating magnetic field. So uh, let's take a look at that. This tag uh, works. This is still an active tag, I know, because I exited the store and the alarm went off. Uh, of course, I paid for the object, but you know, sometimes they don't deactivate the tags. So let's put that in between these two coils here, and you can see there's quite a signal uh, on the scope. So the purple trace is the transmit, and I'm transmitting at about 58 kilohertz, and the yellow is the receive trace, and um, my transmit coil is just about 100 turns of copper here, and I'm using a capacitor mostly just to um, keep DC out. And the receive is just a coil with no matching capacitor at all, just right into the scope. So clearly I haven't spent all that much effort, um, you know, setting up the electronics to be really good. Uh, but I was surprised at how much signal I already got. I mean, that's quite a, a huge difference. Now this tag has been deactivated, so we'll put that one in. And as you can see, uh, almost no change at all. I mean, it's clearly significantly different. So the, uh, the two tags are working as designed, such that this one is active and this was inactive, and we can detect them electrically. So what's actually going on here? The deal is that the transmit coil is creating a very weak magnetic field here. I mean, we're only putting uh, a couple volts or something through this coil. So the field being created here is very weak, but it, it is there, and it's uh, 58 kilohertz, hence the acousto part of this, of this whole thing. And if we put the ribbon in here, uh, it will start to vibrate also at 58 kilohertz. And the exact size of this ribbon is critical for how this thing works. So it's not really a tuning fork, it's more like just a piece of metal. So, you know, if you have a, just a, a flat piece of metal and you, you drop it, it has like a characteristic ring to it. Or if I drop the smaller one, it has a much higher ring to it. So the shape of the ribbon is cut such that uh, this ribbon will resonate at 58 kilohertz. So when we take the active tag and put that between the coils, what's happening is the 58 kilohertz is exciting the ribbon and it's ringing. It's an oscillator. And then we're actually picking up after the transmit pulse is done, we can see this thing ringing down because the oscillator is still going. And in this case, uh, we're seeing even more power in. So with the tag out of the system, it's you know a lower intensity. Once the oscillator gets going, it starts adding its own uh, signal here because the thing is mechanically oscillating and uh, adding more to it. So the trick is that uh, this, this essentially tuning fork is, is adding to the magnetic system. And the two archways on the doorway uh, exiting the store are just like these two coils here. One's a transmit and one's a receive. 
and it pulses the 58 kilohertz on and off and then looks to see if there's this ring down. So if you have one of these tags buried in your cart of stuff somewhere, uh, it will start ringing as you go through, and then this thing listens to the ring down magnetically. So there's no sound being transferred this to, from this back to the system. The only acoustic part of it is the fact that it's using this ribbon that mechanically oscillates at about 58 kilohertz. And um, it's easier and cheaper basically to do it this way than to build, for example, a uh, inductor capacitor network that would oscillate at a similar frequency. I mean, this is just a piece of metal. It costs very little. This is about uh, 25 micron thick. And it's, it's just, it's, it actually is a special alloy, but it's not that exotic. It's mostly iron. And, uh, you know, making these tags is super cheap. So you might be wondering, well, how do you actually turn them on and off? So the next trick, if we had this tag that oscillated and, you know, you go through the doors and uh, it goes off, that works. But how do we turn the tag on and off? The other trick, this other bit of metal in the tag is actually a magnet, a very small, weak magnet. And one of the tricks with this oscillating uh, strip of metal is that in uh, no field, like or in a field where it's, it's normally nothing, let's say just Earth's magnetic field, and then we're transmitting this 58 kilohertz AC magnetic field onto it, uh, it doesn't actually want to oscillate all that much because its characteristics have been tuned such that it needs to have like a, a, a magnet nearby for it to have this 58 kilohertz resonance. The reason for this is that the response curve looks something like this. So if we have increasing magnetic field strength this way and increasing me uh, mechanical output this way, the curve uh, has this kind of S shape to it. So if we're in almost no magnetic field, if we put an AC on top of this, the AC field is kind of going back and forth like this, but we're not getting much mechanical movement out of it because down near zero, this uh, curve is very flat. But if we add a magnet to it, let's say we're now positioned over here because we're near a magnet and we add that same AC to it. Now we're kind of moving up and down the curve like this because we're in a very steep region of the curve. And so uh, the material, that ribbon is tailored such that when it's in almost no magnetic field, it doesn't respond very well to this AC. But when it's in a uh, static magnetic field, then it responds really well. And then, of course, the material saturates. And so if we keep putting more and more magnetic field on it, it eventually doesn't move anymore. And we'll see this under the microscope in, in just a minute. So the trick is that uh, this little cheap magnet in here, it's basically just a thin strip of, of another iron compound. When it's magnetized, the strip is active because it's in that uh, steep region of the slope of the, of the response curve there. So to activate a tag, you put a magnet near it, which magnetizes this you know, permanently, and then the tag is active. And to deactivate one of these tags, you demagnetize the strip. Then it's back down to that shallow area of the curve, and it won't respond. It won't oscillate it's at 58 kilohertz. So we just saw that this tag is working. You can see a pretty big response there. I'm going to demagnetize it uh, by putting it into this open frame motor from which I've removed the rotor. So I'll switch this on and just kind of put the tag through it carefully without shocking myself, hopefully. And uh, let's see how it responds now. It's pretty much gone. I, I, we don't see the same response at all. So this is demagnetized and we're not getting the response. Let's see if we can bring it back to life by putting uh, this magnet near it. So I'll put the magnet here and remagnetize the strip that's in there, hopefully. And we'll see if we're back in business. And we are. It's not quite as much signal as we had when we started, but it's pretty close. So you saw from the graph that uh, the exact level of magnetization of the strip that's in here is actually important too. So I came in here with a really big neodymium magnet and actually caused one of these not to work anymore because I, I over magnetized it or something. So if the metal ribbon in this tag is actually moving enough to mechanically oscillate and cause this whole system to work, I figured I ought to be able to see it. And uh, incorrectly, one of the sources of information on the internet said that the uh, ribbon actually moves a thousandth of an inch. Now this, this ribbon is only, you know, a little more than an inch long. And so uh, one thousandth change in its length is actually quite a lot. And think that, you know, those, the archways that create the magnetic field that actually move this thing are a good, you know, six feet apart at the store. So making this thing move a thousandth of an inch from these coils that are six feet away sounds pretty unrealistic. And sure enough, yeah, it's not even close to true. So I looked up the alloy that this 
uh, ribbon is made of, and I'll, I'll put links to all this in the description. And it says that the saturation uh, magnetostriction value is about 20 parts per million. So in other words, if you had a meter long strip of this ribbon and you saturated it, you put it in a magnetic field big enough to cause it to shrink as much as it ever will, it's gonna move 20 micron. And uh, if this is only a couple centimeters big, then you have to divide that by 50. And so, you know, we're getting really small here. Hundreds of nanometers change. This thing is gonna change hundreds of nanometers, even when it's in a very strong magnetic field. So I tried various ways to measure this. And of course, it was not, you know, it's not easy to measure a couple hundred micron or a couple hundred nanometers. So even putting this into the microscope and looking at it with the highest optical power uh, is not gonna cut it. And then uh, putting it in the scanning electron microscope is not going to work either because the magnetic field is going to uh, affect the electron beam. So this is the apparatus that I came up with to uh, detect its movement. And I'll take it apart here since I've already collected the data. I made a, um, a combination. I basically just took two of the ribbons and uh, put them together so that I had more total length to work with here. So, you know, if this is going to move uh, 400 nanometer, if I put two together, in theory, it should do uh, 800 since it's, it's more length. And I have them inside this coil, and inside the coil there are two very small permanent magnets, fairly weak, um, a ceramic magnet just like this one, but a bit smaller. And they're oriented such that the field is going straight up and down, like out of the table. So when the ribbon is above it, the field is going perpendicular through the ribbon or perpendicular to its face. And then I have a coil of wire here that I can control with a button. And when the coil is on, the magnetic field is going parallel to the table surface like this, a solenoid. I then have a spring pulling this arm down and the ribbon connects to uh, this pivot point on the arm and then a fixed point here. So basically the whole idea is that this guy will move or it's under constant spring uh, tension. And then if the ribbon shrinks a little bit in length, uh, it makes uh, you know, I get a lever effect out of it. And so it's about uh, 20 to one. I'll put the exact numbers in the description. In order to see the movement, I put a very fine wire coming off the end of this. This is actually a carbon fiber rod. It's just a, a non-metallic lightweight, very stiff thing. And then I put a, a thin uh, wire coming off the end and then used the highest power objective that I have so that I could see the wire basically moving back and forth in the microscope's field of view. Uh, so I got video of that and here you can see the wire moving so you can see it sort of click back and forth and that is me uh, pressing the button on and off when the field is perpendicular through the ribbon face uh, the length is a little bit longer and when i turn the solenoid on and the field is parallel to the ribbon uh, the, the the length increases a little bit and you can see why here when the magnetic domains are aligned this way, so the field is going perpendicular through the ribbon, the total uh, length is a little bit less. And then when all the domains line up in this direction, they lengthen a little bit. This property of magnetostriction can be tailored. And so there are some materials that have very high coefficients, like a thousand times higher than what we're looking at now. But the fact is that they, they use weird materials like terbium and whatever. It would make this strip too expensive. And so in order to keep this thing very cheap, they're using um, a fairly standard like iron nickel alloy. I'll put a link to it in the description. To get an idea of how much this thing is actually moving to see if we're in the realm of, of reasonable stuff here, I also looked at a CD-ROM with the microscope with the same setup, same camera, same objective. And the track spacing on a CD-ROM is 1.6 micron. So I made this composite image that shows the wire moving over the CD-ROM so you can get an idea of how much it's actually going. So I'll, I'll figure out the math and then put it in the description there. But I have a feeling that we're talking about movement uh, around the order of one or 200 nanometers for this strip length. Also, just to show how sensitive this setup is, uh, the thermal effects, you know, just a piece of metal expands when it gets warm. And so this is me just breathing on the strip. And you can see that the effect of just a tiny amount of breath touching it, I wasn't right on top of it either, it's just a little bit, is way bigger than the effect caused by magnetostriction. And then just for kicks, I got some freeze spray out and uh, hit it with that. And you can see it just, the, the, the pointer went off the screen because it was just a huge change in comparison. 
Finally, there's actually another effect. So this is just showing uh, about the same volume, but a different um, size change because of the magnetic field. And this is sort of the classic magnetostriction effect. However, for some materials, there's also a very, very slight volume change. So besides the strip keeping the same volume and becoming longer, just putting it into a magnetic field will cause the volume to uh, decrease a very, very small amount. Um, however, I read on the internet, so I don't know if this is true or not, if the Earth didn't have a magnetic field, it would actually be about 10 centimeters greater in diameter because they, you know, it's an iron core and all the magnetic field created by the, the Earth itself is actually causing it to be a little bit smaller because of these effects. So uh, let me know if you think that's true or not, and I will see you next time. Bye.